I'm a kid of the 1970s, and so I was mesmerized by Alex Haley's miniseries Roots, just like the rest of America. But it started me on this journey of wanting to understand, did I really descend from slaves, and who are the slave owners who owned us, and what was that relationship like? Well, it's been almost 40 years, but I'm still on that journey. And so recently, part of that journey was told on NPRs, to the best of our knowledge, because I met a white distant relative who is also a part of the G family. I want you to journey with me. And so I'm dropping a sneak preview of what I found out. This is an interview with my cousin, John. And I know that it's going to raise questions for you like it did for me. But I'm going to go into greater detail in a bundle of interviews that we're dropping right before Thanksgiving. So you won't want to miss this. Take a listen and let me know what you think. Share it with your friends. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. And as always, we have an exciting episode today. I have a relative in the studio with me. and I'm going to be talking with him about family um, connections and family business. Um, John Harkins is my guest. And we met about a year ago on Ancestry.com. And, you know, we go on Ancestry trying to connect up with folks we haven't met before. I didn't know that I was going to find a Welsh, English, Irish cousin, but I did. I know my great great grandfather's name and it's Henderson G. Um, He's my granddad's granddad. And I know that he was born of a woman named Venus who was a slave in Mississippi. And so when I went onto Ancestry.com and I Googled his name or searched his name, I found a reply that was written by a gentleman maybe a year or two prior to that evening who wrote and said, hey, my name is John. I'm white. I just found out that my great great grandfather had a son and his name was Henderson G. Does anyone know anything about Henderson? Well, you can imagine how floored I was finding out that someone else knew Henderson's name, that someone had written about him on Ancestry.com and floored even more that this gentleman was white. Um, because I heard stories, I'm, I'm a student of American history, so of course this is not shocking. I just didn't know that I would find someone in my own family who was also a G. We started writing each other back and forth, and now he's in my city. He's here in Madison. We're doing some great work together, and um, we're trying to find out more about our families, and we're really trying to model what race relations can look like, not only for an American family, but an American family that also happens to be related. And so John Harkins is my guest. He is from Leake County, uh, Mississippi. He grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. He now lives in, um, in, in New Orleans, Louisiana, but he's spending a couple of days with his kinfolk up here in Madison, Wisconsin. So Cutting John, I want to welcome you to uh, Madison and I want to welcome you to Black Like Me. Cutting Alex, I am delighted to be here. <laughs> so this, I mean, this story is really incredible. It's a part of a number of um, po- other podcasts that I'm going to be presenting together because I've just been processing what it means to look at American history through the lens of our family, um, what it is to look backwards in order to look forward. And um, so I've just been processing my trip to New Orleans with you last year. And I know we've been talking about it in so many circles, but not really within my podcast. And so this way we just get a chance to just to talk a little bit. But um, do you remember the night you wrote? I know you remember the night you responded to my message. But do you remember writing that message on Ancestry.com saying, I've got an uncle named Henderson and he's 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 black. And does anyone know him? Do you, do you remember posting that? And were you thinking people were going to write back? Indeed, I do. I uh, learned of our connection uh, through a man who is writing a book on uh, the G family. It's a revisionist history Mm -hmm. of the G family. And uh, I was floored when he sent me actually uh, a picture of Henderson's uh, tombstone. And uh, it was just, I'm also an old time history teacher. So this is... uh, as they say, red meat for me, exploring <laughs> something like this. Uh, it's been an exciting trip. And, right. Uh, i just uh, delighted uh, to be on for the ride. You know, I came on to Ancestry.com at your nudging. I think I did. You know, you can do some free weekends or you can kind of do some light Googling or searching with them. Um, but really, once I found you and other relatives, I sort of backed off. I think one... Ancestry.com can become one 
addictive to just somewhat overwhelming. But it's amazing that you wrote your post. I think it was at least two to three years when I, uh, between the time you wrote it and when I, and when I um, posted. And you are still checking in because you responded to that. So um, I appreciate the fact that you've been up on your genealogy and staying connected with Ancestry.com because some people start and pull back. But I, I appreciate your, your hunger for knowing more about your family and all of your family because some people will pull back those covers and they'll say, oh, I just found you know, some black family members and, well, we know where that comes from and how that starts and let's just close that door down. But you kept it open wanting to look all of history um, in our family, in the eye, because we're not responsible for it. Um, we can move ahead, you know, in, in light of it. But I appreciate the fact that you didn't just bury it and just, ooh, we don't want to open this door. Um, you just, you know, you responded to me when I wrote and said, I'm Henderson's great, great grandson. And one thing led to another. And you wound up inviting me to New Orleans so that we could meet. It's been a wonderful ride. The, uh things that are available to us now because of the technology. And uh, I really believe Ancestry is the best $25 a month habit you can get. <laughs> and there are many months I don't use it at all, but it's just wonderful to know it's there and I have some free time. I'm, uh, I still go to work every day, but I'm not working all day every day. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun thing to go back. For example, to uh, with just a few keystrokes, uh, you can have yourself back in the 1500s in England, uh, where Ralph G. is the first to appear. Ralph with R-A-L-P-H-E. Uh, just fascinating to think you're back in Nottingham, England. Uh, think Robin Hood. Wow. And, uh, and here you've got Ralph G. as uh, one who's uh, participating oh, in the action. Amazing, amazing. I, you know, I, through my work, we offer a U.S. Black History course, and it's a nine-week course. And typically what I do is um, sort of introduce the speaker and a topic for that night. And I can remember when I told people that I met a new cousin on Ancestry.com, the, the participants, mainly white, this is for white allies, um, about 200 of them, 250, said, go, do it, do it, do it. Um, but I can remember I invited a few folks to come with me, and you were warm. And you invited me down and said, sure, I'd like to meet. And then I can remember landing in the, what is it, the Louis Armstrong Airport, mm -hmm. thinking, what the hell am I doing in New Orleans? First of all, it was hot and humid. I think it was like 150 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I landed in hell. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that it's a good place. I know I was going to get good food and good music. But I was just thinking, you know, John's slightly older. He's in his early 70s. What's his perspective of black folks? How does he really feel about this? Is Have I made a mistake? Should I really be down here? Am I opening up a Pandora's box that shouldn't be opened? And I remember we Ubered to your place that Saturday morning, and you had a breakfast spread. You had you know ordered or catered some shrimp etouffee or some type of etouffee for us later in that day. The hospitality, John, was just was just fantastic. You welcomed me with a big hug because I think the big thing in my head was. How do we get to? How do we get into this? I know how to hold my own. I know how to engage if you're engaging. I knew how to be somewhat guarded if you were standoffish. Standoffish, but I thought, okay, what? Like, do we shake hands? You know, we're you know we were relatives. This guy is a G. Um, do, do you know? Do I do I hug him? You know, like how do we break that initial ice? And you open the door on that beautiful porch, and you said, "Cousin Alex," and then gave me a hug, and that just helped to break all of that ice as we as we spent that day together. It's been, as I say, quite a ride. Uh, what you don't know is that actually, because of a high school teacher, I had had my uh, awakening back mm -hmm. uh, in around 1963 when I was a uh, senior in high school. And I went from being this rabid racist, just mouthing what I heard at home, to all of a sudden realizing, hey, wait a minute. This is not how it's supposed to be. And uh, this man opened me up to it, and as early as 1968, I had real fun being involved in the uh, Freedom Democratic Party that uh, Charles Evers was heading right after the murder of his brother, Medgar. And uh, so from that time on, I, I have uh, been involved in this sort of work. For 10 years, I was a teacher, 
And while I tried to uh, take a middle-of-the-road stance, uh, <laughs> the message was there for the 1,000 or 2,000 kids I touched in 10 years. Uh, so it's, it's been quite a ride. Now, the irony of this, John, is um, what was the name of that book? that you're, This was, this was your, um, your, your debate coach, correct? Yes. Yes, it was. Who was what was your debate coach's name? Do you remember? Uh, William Levert, in quotation marks, Bert Gray who was like me, a product of the Old South. He was actually from Natchez, Mississippi. All right. and you don't get much more Old South no, than uh, no, the plantation right. uh, right. mansions of, of Natchez. They had, at one time had more millionaires per capita than any city in the United States. Wow, and that's that, that wealth, like the wealth of the country, came on the backs of exactly. free slave labor. Exactly. It and, was... No, I'm it sorry, was the uh, the funnel coming down through from the Delta, down through Natchez, down through New Orleans, and uh, the cotton shipped over to uh, uh, England. And then Irish, like my family on my father's side, uh, they came. They were shipped back over. These were retrofitted slave ships uh, that came to bring the Irish to North America. They were America. retrofitted slaves. They were. Were they called cruise lines? Was it called Carnival or Princess <laughs> no. or Disney? No, no. <laughs> but interestingly enough, our new rector at uh, Trinity Church in New Orleans, mm -hmm. his family was involved in uh, this trade, the cotton and the transporting of the poor Irish over to the U.S. I guess they have to do something with those with those ships. They built them efficiency. Strong, didn't they? Wow. Efficiency. Yeah. Wow. And so what was the name of the book that you're The name coach? of the book, and this is uh, for your audience, the surprise, uh, it was Black Like Me. It was uh, written wow. by John Howard Griffin mm -hmm. uh, in the early 60s. He, I believe it was a journalist, uh, but he took some medication that actually turned his skin uh, brown. Sure. And so he did this magnificent trip all through the South just reacting to what it was like seeing white and colored uh, water fountains uh, at the bus stations, the white sure. waiting room and the black waiting room. Uh, so he just traveled around and wrote this book just telling it like it was back then. What, what part of it, John, do you think touched you? I mean, because you talked about being a very radical, rabid racist who had this change of heart this you know i think yesterday we talked about sort of this you know for those who, who read or understand new testament literature sort of a saul on the road to damascus experience where you see this light and exactly. you know you, you have this turnaround was it what was it his honesty was it people's response to him do you remember at what point in the pages um the turn happened or did you wait until you finished and just sort of reflected and just said i don't want to be a part of that kind of world it was that, it was not just on a certain page, mm -hmm. uh, but just reflecting on the life I had had. Uh, I had a life of privilege. Uh, we had two maids in our house uh, when I was young, uh, from seven in the morning till seven at night. Uh, and these poor women worked 13 out of every 14 days. And these were black women? These were black women. And they got off, their free time was every other Sunday. So wow. when they started, if they'd had Sunday off, then they were going to be working 13 days straight, including the uh, second Sunday. Wow. Uh, just to be there to get me out of bed in the morning, put me up on a chair and dress me, uh, feed me my meals. Uh, they were the ones who, uh, just in the help, uh, you saw sure. it that uh, these were the women who actually raised so many white kids you know, in the I've, South. I've often read about that or heard about that from a historical perspective, but to hear someone who was the recipient of that kind of care. Um, so what, what, was, what would your mother be doing during the day while these women were waking you up, sitting you on the chair, dressing you, combing your hair, helping you brush your teeth, get off to school? What would your... She was entertaining herself. Uh, she was uh, at first big into making scrapbooks, Mm -hmm. Going to lady lunches, uh, this is a way of life for the white women in the South who had the means to do it. And uh, so that aspect of the book, the help, 
it was pretty accurate. I mean, because well, that's it's what right they, on. But to those who would say, "Oh, it couldn't have been that bad," my standard answer is, "No, it was about ten times worse." You didn't see the really sure, uh, sure teeth crunching side of it. Uh, I told you about uh, my experience when I was no more than six or eight years old asking the maid who was there at the time because I knew my mother was going out to vote that day and I asked her well who are you going to vote for and my mother was just shocked that I would say such and grabbed me and took me in another room and said what are you talking about what are you trying to stir up here don't you know that these people are all upset about voting, so why would you ever bring this up? Wow. I'm thinking to myself, well, why wouldn't I? It seems to me, I mean, here's another human being. You're going to vote. Maybe Beulah's going to vote. Why? Doesn't Beulah vote? No, Beulah doesn't vote. Oh. You know, there, wow, there's so many questions I have about, about Beulah, and we'll come to some other things. Um, like in the help, there was this big thing about the black help not being able to use bathrooms. Do you remember if Beulah was able? Do you remember we just like what her accommodations were like? Like, did she have a room to rest if she oh, needed to? T- that's no, a crazy indeed. question. She didn't rest. She didn't take a no, nap. She had a toilet. No. That's crazy. No, but uh, uh, we just assumed that Beulah did not need to go to the bathroom when she was on duty. Sure. That was just that assumption. That she came in through the back steps. She couldn't walk in through the front door. Did she wear a uniform? She did. Do you, and did your friends have maids who cared for them as well? I mean, was oh, that yes. com- was that commonplace? Oh yeah. Now was that was your family considered well to do or um, middle class? Who who had who had help? Which white families had help? Was it just sort of a common thing in where you lived in Jackson at this time? I would say it was at least half the families, maybe more. Jackson was rigidly segregated back then, mm-hmm. so that the proper folks all lived in the northeast quadrant. All right. You know, if uh, and there were some of my relatives who actually lived on the west side of town, but uh, the northeast quadrant was where it was all happening. And uh, that northeast quadrant has now moved north to Madison County, Mississippi, and uh, they have replicated the old life the scenes you saw in The Help are very much alive now. Uh, my relatives have reached the point that they generally have very nice homes up in Madison County, but what's happened is that uh, the uh, tax base for Hines County, the old Jackson, has mm-hmm. disappeared so that now you would think you were in a Central American town that I've experienced just because of the lack of upkeep of the streets. Sure. I came in late one night a couple of years ago and was so appalled at what it was like in the old downtown area. Now, we're talking about the main business area of Jackson when I grew up. Uh, It's just unbelievable how the city is struggling to survive without the tax base. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you've got this idyllic suburbia 20 miles north in Madison and County. And it's thriving. Yes. You know, John, I was, I've been thinking about something um, that you mentioned. You alluded to it a little bit ago, but you and I spoke about it a bit yesterday. You have, and, and for those who are listening, um, in, in 15 countries all over the world you're listening, um, I wasn't just making up the name Beulah. Beulah was one of the one of the maids that worked she for your was. family. I know that's sort of a sort of a common name or stereotypical name of a, of a, of a, of a maid. But um, the person who wakes up in the morning and gets you ready and feeds you is usually someone you have um, warm feelings towards. And so the mm-hmm. fact that society creates within you or manipulates this reality for you so that you start as a young boy seeing Beulah one way. Mm-hmm. But then by the time you're in high school, you see Beulah and black people complete, in a complete different way. And so... Where does that shift start happening for for white male Mississippians who are dressed and fed by these black women? And by the time, you know, you're 18, they don't need rights. They don't need to vote. They're not 
They're not equal. Where does where does where does society get you? Was that the home? Was it church? Was it society? Um, when when did you stop being this wide eyed young boy who's being cared for by this woman? That as you come of age until your conversion process, supporting her or giving back to her was the furthest thing from your mind. Where, where did society start getting a young Mississippian like you and in, in putting that hate and venom in you? You just really grow up with it. It's mm-hmm. it's all around. You hear you. it all around. You, you. hear it. Um, it was interesting to me uh, as someone who tries to stand back and watch, do people watching rather than uh, being actively involved, uh, the worst, the uh, use of the N-word mm-hmm. when I was a kid. And I observed it on all the different levels. Uh, in my family, uh, there was this considered to be middle ground uh, that there was a slight bit of polish put on the N-word, though when something sparked that racism, there could be a retreat. Sure, sure. And especially back to uh, like my grandparents' generation. So there's been ever so slight change, and now there's sort of a veneer why wow, we're not racist, you know, we, we te- treat those people nicely. Look what we have done for them. Right. Rather than look what they have done for us. Right, right. And what they have overcome because of us. Exactly. So it's just sort of in the water that you're drinking, in the air that you're breathing, that, that this transformation happens. And I'm sure you saw it with your peers, that they probably have these loving, loving relationships with, with, with the help. But then you all are emerging of age together, having similar politics and similar views by these by these individuals. It's it seems almost um, systematic in in helping to train these young white boys into becoming um, young white men who would maintain that societal status quo. The status quo. That's it. That's that's really really interesting. Um, wow wow. Um, and so did your family have help all the while you were in high school? I mean, when you, when you, what about yeah. when you were finishing high school, you still yeah, had Yeah, there help? was a time that, uh, they dropped back to just having one maid, uh, rather than two. But, uh, it was just sort of like how life was back then. That's very interesting. And so you're reading Black Like Me, you're processing your background and your history. And by the time you get to the end of the book... You're in conflict, um, some inward turmoil because, you know, although you feel like the shift came somewhat overnight, that was a huge um, paradigmic shift for you. Did it did it take you a long time to say I'm different after reading the book? Did you no. sort of confess this to someone to your to your parents? I actually followed this teacher. Uh, off to college. I've told you about how I was supposed to go to Mississippi State, which is where my father had been president of the alumni. But I came to realize uh, on a visit up there, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I've got to get out. And uh, I find it watering on the absurd now to call Baton Rouge, Louisiana, (laughs) uh, a liberal oasis. (laughs) But in actual fact... That tells me how bad home was for you in Mississippi. uh, I remember driving off at uh, August day in 1963, uh, heading off to a new life. Wow. And I was a history major, and so it was just all fed together. Sure. Uh, I... uh, started voting. I'm a yellow dog Democrat. Uh, Explain what a yellow dog Democrat is. I, I did some research because you're the first person I heard use it. But for those who are listening to us, that does that does the history go back to folks saying I would rather vote for a yellow dog than, than a Republican candidate? Am I- that's, that's what it comes down to. Uh, I am so uh, attached to the ideals of the Democratic Party that, uh, yes, if if it came down to it, you would vote for a yellow dog before you would vote for a Republican. So you were a history major. You taught you taught history in school. Just give me a snippet of what 
American history, how it was taught when you were when you were a kid. Like like how did how were you taught about slavery? How were you taught about the place of black folks or women? Do you remember do you, do you remember oh. sort of the mindset of what the, oh, what the history absolutely. was? Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and, and if, yeah, I wonder if the textbooks and others back this may, up too. Others may uh, uh, remember this, uh, those in the South at least, uh, that American history ended somewhere between 1863 and 1865. <laughs> and when I came into Vicksburg, Mississippi— You were taught that. Oh, that's, that's as far as the uh, course would go. Wow. Because by that time, there was such an obsession with the Civil War that— uh, and and it had its various names, you know. It wasn't really called the Civil War. Right. It was uh, the recent unpleasantness, uh, <laughs> is my favorite uh, expression for the Civil really? War. Really? Yeah. Recent unpleasantness. The recent unpleasantness. Did some call it the War of the States? Uh, the War of Northern Aggression. Wow. Yeah. There, there were all kinds of ways this was played with. But I came into Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1969 and shocked my students when we got to the Civil War. And I was rushing through it because I believed in, let's bring it on down to the 19, let's talk about World War II. It was never even mentioned by most history teachers, because you got to the Civil War and you got bogged down, mm -hmm. and that's where you stayed. And so when I told my students that I was gonna devote one week out of 40 to the Civil War, they, they just couldn't believe it. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean you're only gonna talk for a week? You know, that's our history. I mean, there I was in Vicksburg, Mississippi, obsessed with the Vietnam War, which was sure. moving my life along. But all of a sudden, it hit me that all these people talking about the war were actually talking about the Civil War, not Vietnam. Wow. This is an important point because I think for many Americans, particularly many white Americans, don't really feel that people can manipulate history. I mean, history is academic, it's absolute, it's real. You can't manipulate it more than you can sunshine or rain or wind. Not but you're true. saying it's not true, that there, no. there's bits and pieces of it. And I think, John, that's what the folks who attend our U.S. Black History course that we put on through our nonprofit, I think that that's, that's the point at which their eyes are open. They probably have a similar aha to what you had while reading Black Like Me. They think, wait a minute, we weren't taught this. And some have come up to me and said that they were high school history teachers or elementary history teachers. And they've said, we've never heard this. And they're wrestling with the fact that this is, you can Google this. These things that are being taught have happened, but they can't, um, they can't balance the fact that this is not the way they were taught history. And they feel that they've been duped and they're out teaching something that's not 100% accurate. And I think for many of our participants in our history class, that's the point at which they want to become allies because now they believe that maybe the people of color have been onto something by saying, well, you know, the full truth is not being told. So thank you for clarifying that by talking about the way, the way you were taught history. That's interesting. Um, when you and I got together at your place um, um, last year, you had a picture of your great grandfather. His name is Robert Lafayette G. He was called RLG. And um, he had a half-brother, Henderson G., who's my great-great-grandfather. So I had my photo, you had yours. We have since um, pasted the two together. But it was apparent to both of us, as a black man, as a white man, that our great-grandfathers, your great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, looked a lot alike. Sometimes people oh. think if you're different ethnic groups, you can't favor. But as soon as we put them together, the hairline, the eyebrows, the nose structure, the face structure, it was apparent to us these men were these men were related, and they must have looked a lot like their father because you could just see the stark family resemblance. Absolutely. Um, so, so we started. I remember us sitting down at the table trying to figure out, you know, were we first cousins, fourth cousins, third cousins, once removed. But what we realized is that I'm probably a generation because of my age, a generation further away, which is why it's my great great grandfather and your mm -hmm. great grandfather. Um, but that's just so interesting because as we've looked at the census tracts back in the 1870s, 1880s, we found 
that that Henderson G, my great great grandfather, at some point after um, the Civil War and after the ending of slavery, lived next door to Reuben G, his his father. So Reuben G was my great 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 grandfather, but Reuben G is your great great, great grandfather. Great. Yes. So two greats, three greats, for me. So um, that's that's just so interesting to figure out that somehow in this big world of billions of people these two brothers had gathered to, to try to settle to, you know, their, their sister's murder mystery and 120 years later their descendants, the descendants of RLG and of Henderson G, find each other on, on Ancestry.com and bring these pictures of, of our respective um, ancestors together and start comparing notes and moving ahead in our relationship and you and I know that that's more than just being serendipitous or coincidental but that's still so amazing that in this vast world 120 years later their descendants you and I would find each other and our daughters were part of that discussion as well exactly it's uh, quite a revelation but what really still intrigues me and I'm hoping that this next book about the G murder uh, is going to get more into it uh, Back at that time, I do believe there was an accommodation, and that in a way, relations were better back then than perhaps they are today. That's a scary but probably true statement. So I, I, I like the glass to be half full. Sure. But at the same time, it's it's concerning to me that uh, those of my generation are so fearful of this discovery and, and really won't know part in it. What do you think the real fear is that, that I as their black relative might want something from them or might want to accuse them or it's the shame, E all the above. What do you, what, what do you think the fear is in the hearts of some people that you and I have made this discovery and we're talking about it on you know, international podcasts, you know, you and I are you know, working on a documentary together, we're talking about this, we're writing to each other. What's what's so frightening to them about us discovering our past and healing from it and learning to be family in spite of all of our US history? What do you think's frightening about that for, for your for your friends and family I think members? There is a sense of shame. Mm -hmm. They have built up the uh, their position in society. Uh, these are for the most part, really well-off people who are living up in this uh, ideal county mm -hmm. that's their their new uh, home, and uh, uh, they just want to sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, people have told me, now why don't you just, why do you want to stir this up? You know, we, we just don't want to talk about this. And I said, well, you know, Cousin Alex is a rather large person human being to sweep under the rug. We're going to have a big lump there. And, <laughs> and I know, know Alex well enough to know he's not, he's not <coughs> a provocateur. But at the same time, he's an easygoing guy who's just trying to move all of us forward. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I just don't want to push him under the rug. Wow. And, you know, we may still win some over. What I love is we have not allowed some of that pushback to hinder us from talking um, and for connecting. Because, you know, this has been a way of life for hundreds of years for families. And, um, and for this to come out of left field could, could be unsettling. For me, it's very affirming. Because as I, can, as I have connected with you, um, my thought was not... Um, they owe me something. I, I want to prove to them um, that that I overcame, no matter no matter what. I really just wanted to learn more about um, this American dynamic. I wanted to learn more about what those relationships were like. I think more importantly for me, you give me a perspective of what life may have been like for my great grandfather Oscar or my mm -hmm. great great grandfather Henderson. And in some ways, I feel very very blessed to live out a reality that was only a dream for them. I mean, when you consider Henderson living next door to his brother, R.L., your great-grandfather, um, knowing that they were brothers, they have the same last name. I mean, it wasn't called like Henderson, no last name, it was Henderson G, it's R.L.G. There are days I probably think Henderson may have dreamed of doing everything that R.L. did because 
you live together. They probably didn't eat together, but they lived in the same community. They, they, their kids probably knew each other. My grandfather, my father told me, his grandfather told him stories that the black and the white Jews would play together mm-hmm. until some of the family members of the white Jews would come and then the black Jews would have to start using the back door again. But mm-hmm. the kids really grew up playing together because again, like when you're a child, kids aren't really focused on this stuff. That's the sadness of racism. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a learned reality because as children, you know, the kids weren't focused on that. But I feel that um, in some ways, John, you and I are having conversations that I bet on days R.L. and Henderson wanted to have, but the law didn't allow it, history didn't allow it, and it was so unfathomable. It was, it, it, they knew that they were relatives because of some indiscretion of their father, but you and I out of choice are sitting and talking, and I can't help but thinking that somehow we're finishing sentences that they've started or having starting conversations they couldn't. And for me, that's what I want to get out of the relationship. I want to feel that, I want, I, want, I want to feel that, I want to believe that the pressures that kept them from really being family, um, whether they've dissipated or not, they don't have enough power over you and I to allow us petru- to perpetuate that same sense of, sense of distance. So as we get a chance to talk not only about our future, but the horrendous past, that's really helpful for me because I don't feel like you're sweeping things under the rug. I don't feel like you're saying, well, no, you know, the G's were really, you know, they were migrant workers. They were really traveling around, you know, picking, you know, cotton and then going from community, you know, county to county. You and I have talked. Um, you know, the family members built some pretty good wealth. The South built some pretty good wealth on the backs of free labor. That's established. That's that's real. That's happened. But I think because we both move or understand that basis, we're able to dream about the brighter future, which is why I think you felt comfortable bringing your daughter to the table, and I felt comfortable bringing my daughter to the table. I didn't want to bring her into some ugly uh, step back into the past where there's, mm-hmm. you know, where we're spewing accusations and pointing fingers. I felt committed enough to the fact that I want to model what it's like to look back, acknowledge it, but allow that to fuel a better tomorrow. But the fact that you and I both showed up with our daughters signals to me that you, like I, must have some hope that between races, between blacks and whites, we can do much better than what we've done. Amen. Um, so, John, you're about to tell me a story about about This one is something. one that it took me most of my life to come back and be able to repeat. And it actually, you know, I'm uh, making fun of myself in a way, but... God, there's a real story there. When I was about uh, uh, seven or eight years old, when television first came to Jackson, Mississippi, uh, you asked what my mother was doing. Well, Mm -hmm. among her many activities, she was addicted to contests. She had come from a a yeoman farmer family. Uh, She was born in a dog trot house down in South Mississippi. But uh, she was a very smart woman, uh, even back in the uh, 1930s. Uh, she took courses in law school. But um, wow, she, she loved uh, entering a contest. She mm-hmm. had a very competitive side. So uh, there was a milk company, uh, the Grey Ghost, if you remember from history, the southern hero during the uh, Civil War, uh, Major Mosby, and the Mosby family had a dairy up above Jackson in Madison County, and with the advent of television, they decided that what they really needed was a slogan or a jingle uh, to sell more milk. So they uh, set up this contest, and the winner would get uh, a television set, 21-inch black and white television set. (laughs) Seems uh, rather... Uh, uh, unremarkable now, but back then. It probably weighed a ton, too. Oh, it did. Big box thing. And um, so my mother entered it not once, but probably six or eight or ten times. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? uh, Guess who the winner was? Turned out this little seven or eight year old boy allegedly had written uh, this slogan a gallon of pleasure in every ounce. 
that was <laughs> that's that pretty was, good. And it was good. It won the contest. <laughs> and so next thing you know, here I am, eight years old, being uh, trotted onto a TV set uh, a set in the uh, most primitive time of local TV. But I'm introduced to it, and the uh, genial uh, MC is there presenting me with the television, and he had just barely seen me for two or three minutes before going live on TV, but uh, he just said, now, Johnny, I understand that you love Mosby's milk, and in my best young boy Southern uh, <laughs> Seeking uh, the uh, uh, appreciation of the guy, I say, why, yes, sir. Why, just today, I told my maid, Mo Goldie, Goldie, you get yourself on down to the grocery store and get me some of that good old Mosby's milk. And with that, I grinned from ear to ear, <laughs> and I thought I was just the perfect kid. Well, from the perspective of 2018, talking about my maid, Goldie. Run down to the store and fetch you me some. Get yourself and go fetch me some milk. I mean, is this real? Wow. It's quite a reflection. Sure. Of what 1952 Jackson, Mississippi was like. It's a reflection of power, too. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, for a child being able to speak to any adult in that way, but understanding the power dynamics she was okay. mine. She was my definitely, maid. Definitely, and she was ex exactly. And this is, this is almost this is ninety years after the abolition of slavery. But that mindset. This is the piece that we're trying to help people to understand that even though the legal system of slavery changed when it became a part of Jim Crow and separate but equal and all of those things, the mentality that this was mine, she is mine, hadn't changed in the minds of people. That's a powerful. That's a powerful image, and that's a powerful point for people to ponder, who are trying to understand what we mean about um, this this systematic mindset. It's almost as if people were bequeathed this sense of entitlement. They were. Like, what do you do by the age of eight to think that you have a maid, and they'll you know they'll they'll do that? And it wasn't just you. Just that mindset in young. And young children, um, so it's my generations it's had a lot to overcome. My hope is that through my children, that's what I'm wondering about. What, what do we not pass for? this down to my children? Well, I met your daughter, so I'm certain you have not with her. But 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 the fact that you're focused on it um, and that you want to talk about it helps you to not do so. But you're not just hoping by just spitting in the wind. I mean, I'm certain you've talked with her about oh, these absolutely. kinds of things. And that's what parents have to do as well. I think, John, parents think that because their children are so good-natured, they won't have some of those fears. And so you'll grow out of your goldie going to the store and fetching you some milk. But if you don't check that or ask that or hold people accountable, why would a young person grow into an older person and stop thinking that way? So you want to not only hope that you've not passed it down to your children, you talk to I them. I affirmatively... Talk to them about that. Them and what are parents doing? Years. What do we say to parents who think that their children are really good nature, but they're being raised up in this crazy world? Again, it's this world and this environment that helped to create you into that 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 racist person with those views because it's just the water you swim in. What do you say to parents who just think, oh, my children will just learn better? You know, they watch black people on television. They like listening to Drake. You know, they watch Oprah. They they don't they don't see all these color differences, so they don't talk to their to their children. What do you think is at risk when parents don't talk to their children about these harsh realities? I think there's a great risk. You know the irony that while you and I and family members are sitting at your dinner table, talking about how we wanted to be unified and what level of cousins we were, this whole predicament in Charlottesville was happening. Exactly. In the background. I mean, this was a Saturday. I remember um, um, Tyler had mentioned to me, he was with us, and he had mentioned, um, hey, you may want to check social media. Something's going on in Charlottesville. But because we were, I was so focused in our gathering, we only had a day together, I didn't really tune into it until later that night of the next day, 
I realized that you know all of this upheaval was going on. So for me, that was that was very ironic that you, we're here talking to our children about how we don't repeat the past, and then you have these white men in Charlottesville reliving the past and trying to invoke the past, the old past. I just think the juxtaposition between what was happening there and what was happening um, in New Orleans at your dinner table was pretty was pretty amazing. Have you, have you thought about that juxtaposition of what was happening that day? Exactly. I'll make it even more personal. I have a niece. My oldest niece lives in Charlottesville. Oh, really? But the topic has never been brought up. It's really. I, I'm I'm closer to her mother, my sister, than anyone else in terms of my relatives. Sure, sure. And my sister is not of the same mindset that I am. She is a Republican who voted for Trump. Mm-hmm. But this is just symptomatic. You just don't bring up the topic. Gotcha. For a long time, we did not have a good relationship. Now we do. But we have learned that when it comes to politics or religion, we can't talk about it. Now, we're far enough along that we might make a little joke about something. Like, hey, what's your boy doing in D.C. right now? (laughs) But uh, we don't go into it in depth. And no one in the family has ever mentioned Charlottesville. That's so interesting. That's really... I mean, if... If we hear about a, a cold weather snap in Wisconsin, in Madison, I have friends from the other part of the country who will text me and say, hey, man, we're in California, but we heard pipes are bursting in, in, in Madison. Are you guys okay? Um, but yet this happens, something this egregious happens in Charlottesville, and there's no signaling, there's no communicating with each other about what's happening. No, you just there. don't talk about it. Wow. So that's so interesting. Yeah. Another Southernism is... You might hurt their feelings. So you just let sleeping dogs lie. Exactly. You know, John, one of the, I'm going to talk about one of the big takeaways that um, I left New Orleans with. And because um, I've had a chance to ponder this. So don't feel put on the spot if, if there's not one or two that comes to mind. But I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, always one of two black students in the class. So I've grown up with sort of this innate sense of responsibility that many people of color feel when you're outnumbered that way, um, that somehow the weight of your entire race is resting on your shoulders. And so, um, you know, if I'm not prepared for meetings, if I don't show up on time, there's a concern that, hey, others will think that this is how black people function. But so I've grown up with thinking I gotta, I've got to be the first one there and the last one to leave. Um, you know, those kinds of things has worked into my achievement. We talked about that You're part the of, overachiever. Right. The part of that is part of that's, you know, a G-ism. Um, it's part of, you know, what, you, what you've noticed in G's. But when I sat um, with you and Joan and Paul and Meg and others in your home, I realized um, I've been around white individuals my entire life, and I've often felt this need to perform or to show I deserve to be at the table. That day, I'm sitting with white people who are relatives. They've got G blood, since found out G and Wilder blood, at least with you and Meg, which I'm a Wilder also. Both of our great-grandfathers married women who were Wilders. Um, But I walked away from that day feeling a sense of, um, of appreciation for my family's journey. I think, I think, What's difficult for African American men or for African Americans who experience some level of success in mainstream society is that if you say, wow, I've made headways, it might sound like you're saying there's no systemic issue, everyone just pulls themselves up by the bootstrap. If I could just merely complain about the systems, I'd then take no personal responsibility. The gift that that gathering gave me last summer was that for the first time in my life, I sat with a group of white people. I re- that was that's that wasn't new, but who were relatives? That was very new, and I didn't feel the need to perform. I felt, you know, I understand the history. We're all descendants of Reuben G. He was married to a, a, um, a, a Aurelia. Aurelia. Aurelia, and so and so you're a descendant of Aurelia, but I'm a descendant of a child he had with a slave, and. Um, but for the first time in my life, I was able to make this decision. I'm sitting here with white people who are relatives, and 
I'm just resigning from feeling as if I've got to prove that I'm somehow worthy or just as good. I sat here and I thought, John's a homeowner, I'm a homeowner. His daughter's in college, in grad school. My daughter's applying to grad school. He's a professional, I'm a professional. It's been 120 years since my great-great-grandfather and your great-grandfather probably sat in a room together and talked. But when I looked at what my faith, my family's commitment, my mother's strong teaching um, has instilled in me, I was able to sit there and think, in the light of our history, um, I'm not just a descendant of a slave owner, but I'm a descendant of a slave who believed that one day his children's children's children would be just as good as his white siblings' children. And I felt that the embodiment of that, the, the actualization of what that unspoken dream of, of, of Henderson's was, and that has been a tremendous gift to me. It's been difficult to articulate it because I know that there are systemic realities that make it tough for people to climb out, which is why I'm in the work that I'm in. But that day sitting, sitting at your table, I just felt a true resignation to performance. And I, f I felt more comfortable in my own black skin that day. Not because someone told me it was okay to be black. I just sat there realizing how much my family had to work to sit at that table with you and Joan and others um, as an equal. No one, no one handed it to me. It wasn't a freebie. I worked for it. But I walked away with this great sense um, that within my lineage of folks who have been enslaved or enslaved through sharecropping, their dream for equality, their dream for strong black men, their dream for strong family men, their, strength, their, their, their dream for professionalism um, was realized in me and others in my generation. And that was more powerful to me than I'm able to articulate. That was a great thing that I walked away with, that I'm not just a victim of history, but I'm a victor. I, in light of all the things that African American people had experienced, and that in my family and Jeeves had experienced at the hands um, initially of their relatives who were white Jeeves, for us to sit at the table um, as equals and treat that like the norm was was powerful. I don't know if you have any reflections on that, but that was a real powerful moment, and that's what I brought home with me from um, New Orleans, that for the rest of my professional career, for the rest of my life, I'm going to serve out of my strength and not some aura that I want to project or some image I want to portray, but out of the true essence of who I am as a product of this very, very, very strong lineage. Um, that's a gift that no one will ever be able to take away from me. And um, that space with you and your family afforded that realization to happen for me. I appreciate that space. It's been a gift for me as well. Uh, as I said early on in this visit, uh, to borrow from Dickens, uh, this is the worst of times, but this is the best of times. And I'm really, as, as a political junkie all my life, I'm really upset by what is going on right now I in am this too. country. I am too. But at the same time, I was in uh, New York back in February and went to see Hamilton oh, with my daughter. I've got to still get to see and, that. And that is just the most wonderful affirmation for those of us who have been struggling to, mm -hmm. to change things. That was the most wonderful experience I have ever had of a production on the stage. Wow. The fact that we sat there and all of a sudden you realize that, hey, colorblindness is here. We could watch those actors, and I believe the majority now are still African American, but mm -hmm. there are Hispanics, there are Orientals, there are white Anglo folks, and they're all performing on the stage. and. Do you really stop and think, wow, Ben Franklin's a black man? <laughs> well, yes, and and we can watch it. I'm that explains I'm, the shag haircut. It does. It does. <laughs> I'm going to uh, going back to New York in August. You're going to see it again. I'm going to see it again, paying nine hundred dollars for a ticket to what? see it, and it's a bargain. It's a after you see it, you will say. You wouldn't think twice about putting out another 900 
wow. to see this. That's a great plug for, for Hamilton. And I'm uh, connecting with uh, a friend who goes back to first grade. We were together through all of this. Sure, and sure. we're fellow travelers politically. Uh, we were debate partners. And so when we decided to uh, uh, get together, uh, and his wife will be a part of it too, he came up with the idea, well, you're so big on Hamilton, why don't we go back and see it again? And that's what I'm doing. Oh. And I tell you, Alex G., you must go see I Hamilton. Will. I will. I understand it's in Chicago right now. It is. I need to go see it. I need to go see it. So I'll do that because I know Lexi's really been wanting to see it. We wanted to do it around her 21st birthday back in last December, but maybe it'll be sort of a post-graduation gift. Be a you great thing it. to do during the summer. It'll be a great gift for you as well. Right, and I won't have to fly. So that I mean, yeah. that's some of the savings. No, that's no, that's really good. That's it real. is just so rich. That's really good. Well, John, I hope that we have many, many um, more conversations. I felt very warm being in your home and being in your city. I hope that you felt and some of that reciprocal. It in reciprocal. Absolutely, good. that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. And and now Jackie wants to come to New Orleans. With me, because we love Bring to. Her on down, as they say on that trash that's TV. Right, that's thing. right. Come, Come on, on down. down. <laughs> we would love to do that. And um, whether or not any more relatives from that, you know, from Mississippi, New Orleans, come to the table or not, I want us to continue our discussions because people are listening and they want hope. They want to believe that this can happen. And if we can look at overcoming the issues of what what happened to really start my family line out of yours then certainly people who've had a spat because of a fence or a dog or a fight between their children can overcome those those issues, particularly those that are peppered by race, that they can overcome them as well. And so I'm looking forward to not only um, posting this podcast, but others around my trip to New Orleans, because it was a very watershed moment for me and just rethinking my place in history, your place in history, and also the redemptive nature. I feel that... Um, I don't carry the weight of all black people everywhere, but I certainly carry some of the weight of the black Welsh G's yes. um, who, who've come out of Leake County, Mississippi. I feel um, um, the dutiful responsibility or, or the dutiful joy of, of living and networking and working out unity in a way that would make them proud. And that feels like um, a good responsibility to be to be charged with. And so... Thank you for your time. Thank you for, for talking with me. Thank you for sharing your heart, for sharing your history and your past and your thoughts and, 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 and thoughts about your transition. It's very, very helpful. It's very seldom that we get to hear uh, a white Southern gentleman talk about things like the help or your experiences or your politics. And so please know that we're touching thousands of people and your voice is resonating with the hearts of other young men and young women who have been looking for something but haven't had any examples of the type of transformation that you've experienced and you continue to experience. And the fact that we're doing this together as family just gives us a whole new wrinkle um, of, 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 um, of interest and possibility. So thank you so much. I'm going to say, brother, you're doing it. I'm not calling you cousin no. this time. Brother. Cousin. Co we're, we're brothers That's right. on this journey, and it's a beautiful thing. It is. And, John, you know, as brothers, I want, you remember when you and I were walking across the street from lunch, we realized, for both of us being men of faith, the ability to forgive, the ability to look ugliness in the eyes and move ahead from it is very, very important. And so I appreciate the fact that um, we are not trying to wrestle through these very tough issues on our own strength, that we believe that God gives us the strength for doing this. Oh, absolutely. And, and the peace of, that you clearly acknowledge that these things have happened, that you haven't swept those under the rug, is helpful because we can look to the future because we don't have to try to determine whether or not the past really happened. But because we know what happens, and you've been able to articulate to me what it's meant for America to become a superpower, our families to acquire wealth because of not having any personnel cost, um, gives us a, a starting point. And now we can begin to live out a better, a better future. So I appreciate it. I'm very excited about that. And um, hey, friends, continue to um, show your excitement and your love for the Black Like Me podcast. Continue to repost it and tell your friends about it. Most importantly, have your friends subscribe. That way, we're able to, to deliver each week's um, 
episode to you directly. You don't have to go trying to find it. You can you can search for Black Like Me on iTunes or Spotify, or if you're an Android user, you can just search for Black Like Me podcast in your search bar, and you'll be able to find it as as well. Um, I love being able to bring these exciting interviews and conversations to you. And if you have ideas um, for shows or topics or discussions or questions for future guests, just tweet out um, at me. Um, I, you can reach me on Twitter at, at Alex G. Jr. Um, I'm on Facebook as Dr. Alexander G. Jr. You can get all of that at alexg.com. If you just go to my website, you can find out how to find all of the, find me on all of those social networking um, platforms. But help us get the word out. It is the word of mouth that has taken us to over 15 countries. So each week we keep telling you to listen to learn, and to live better. Thank you again for being part of the Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G. podcast.